Hi, good evening, welcome. Thank you for coming. Welcome to Diaz um, Readings in Contemporary Poetry. My name is Jasmine Raymond, and I am here to introduce Vincent Katz, who would then introduce our, our poets tonight. But um, a few things I want to mention um, to remind you that on Tuesday, November 30th, Zoe Leonard will be here um, reading from the new book published by Dia titled You See I Am Here After All. It's, uh, it starts at 7 p.m. It's a reading, and it will be with an introduction by the curator of the exhibition, Lynn Cook, former DIA curator. And also, I want to remind you that um, on Mondays, we held, once a month here, we hold our um, Artist on Artist lecture series. And our next one is Joachim Koster, an artist from Denmark, will be coming to speak about Solewit. That's on December 13 at 6.30 p.m. And the following um, Thursday, December 16 at 6.30, is Charles Bernstein and Tim Peterson. So please join us on that um, second round of poetry. Um, this program is supported with, uh, with the help of um, Barbara and Charles Wright and an anonymous donor. So we're very grateful to them for their support. And as well, we are to Christine Howe in the Curatorial and Education Department, Jean Dreskin and Patrick Hellman for their help putting together the series. So tonight, um, Vincent will introduce um, Stacy and Eileen. But I, when I when I came to the about a year ago and was talking with Philippe Verne, the as director, we decided that there was one program that was missing in in our array of things we do, exhibitions and lectures and so on. And it was this special series of poetry and. Um, since I knew nothing about poetry, <laughs> my poetry sort of ended with Pablo Neruda, I decided to uh, reach out to an old friend, Vincent Katz, and I went to have dinner with him and his wife, Vivian, and started casually talking about restarting this program. And I'm very happy that we did it. And, and here we are. So please um, welcome Vincent Katz. I think Jasmiel is being a little modest. Her poetry knowledge went up at least as far as Ann Lauterbach and Taylor Mead. Welcome to Readings in Contemporary Poetry. This is the second reading in the series. The first one was Taylor Mead and John Giorno. That was fantastic. And the next, as Jasmiel mentioned, is on December 16th with Charles Bernstein and Tim Peterson, AKA Trace. This is a continuation of a series that ran under the direction of Bridget Mullins here at DIA from 1987 to 2003. Um, and so we're happy to be bringing that series back to life under the same name. Um, it's a little bit different from the past series. In the previous series, uh, chose two well-known poets going toe to toe against each other, so to speak presenting retrospectives of their work. And um, it was great. There was a, a great variety of poets in that series. Um, in this series, we decided to, to do something different. We're not asking poets to do retrospectives. In fact, on the contrary, we're asking, we're providing this opportunity as a place to do something different if they want to, to use music, projections, clowns. I always mention clowns because one of the artists who did a presentation on another artist used a clown, so I hope some poets will use clowns at one point to keep up with the artists. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, that poets are actually very ornery and they prefer to many times just stand up and read their poetry, which is also exploratory and experimental. So it's up to them, they do whatever they wanna do. Um, but they probably don't do a retrospective and then the other thing that we were doing that's, that's different from the previous series is uh, we're, we had this idea of presenting two poets who have something in common, uh, which can be that something in common is the interesting variable because it can be uh, a poetic lineage, it could be political, social, it could be geographic, it could be anything really, but that are 
from different generations. We thought that that would be interesting. We're not, it's not that every reading will hew to that, but the majority of the ones that we've booked do have that relationship. And so to have one reader who is at or near the beginning of her or his arc as a poet paired with another poet who is already iconic or essential or in the, dare I say it, in the canon. And actually, I have to read this sentence that, that refers to that. It will make vivid an essential component of poetic history, the diverse expressions of lineage, because a lot of the influences that are affecting many poets are being expressed differently in different generations, and hopefully we'll see that. So Jasmine took care of the thank yous, so I'm going to go right to the intros. Um, Stacy will read first, followed by Eileen, and we'll have a, a short break in between. I was told to make it very short. I think with Taylor and John, we might have had a two or three hour break in between the readers. So <laughs> we're going to try to keep it to an hour and a half this time. <laughs> Stacy Semazic was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the summer of 1969 and grew up there. She studied at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, graduating in, like, 1991 with a BA in literature. She's the author of the books Emptied of All Ships, 2005, and Hyperglossia, 2009, both published by Litmus Press, as well as numerous chapbooks, including Pasolini Poems, Psy Press, 2005, Orizaba, A Voyage with Hart Crane, Faux Press, 2008, Stacy S. Auto Portraits, OMG 2008, and From Heart Island, Albion Books 2009. From 1999 to 2005, she worked at Woodland Pattern Book Center in Milwaukee. In 2005, she moved to New York City, where she is the artistic director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church. Stacy Semazic's poetry makes clear for her reader the distinction between vertical and horizontal. Reading emptied of all ships, one is lulled as by waves, by narrow lines of verse flowing page by page, most of them composed of only one or two words. The whole book takes seafaring as its metier, and this is both literal and metaphoric, historical and current, about craft and emotion. As abstract as much of the language is, due to its determined diminishing of syntax's constraints, still the personal keeps making itself felt, quote, width of back-belted sodium poultice exhausts courtship, drain a home of you, phenomena foregone for me, and significantly, assonance, her aspect, Lulled, as I said, by such lines, it is a shock to discover on page 53 in the poem Some Mariners a completely opposite sense of line, one that moves from side to side in long sweeps, quote, sequent of waves albumen ferment, white cap floats hum syllables of elegy. From there the flow opens and there is a playing with translation. Ostensibly by an unidentified James, these translations from the Chinese notes at the back reveal, are really by Kenneth Rexroth and others. Translation plays a central role in Semazic's chapbook, Pasolini Poems. Read on its own, Pasolini Poems is a tasteful homage to the master, cineast, poet, and novelist. When you compare it with Pasolini's own Roman poems, published by City Lights in 1986, you find that Semazic has actually written one poem for every Pasolini poem, keeping his original titles. It is common for poets to base works on other works, whether literary, visual, performative, sociological, historical, etc. Somehow, Semazic manages deftly to avoid the pitfalls of idolatry, distilling a verbal and personal experience that is utterly distinct. Semazic's most recent book is Hyperglossia, which my memory of Greek tells me should mean an over-tonguing. 
As in Emptied of Ships, the visual aspect of the poems is central, with words separated on lines in a way that reminds me of certain Anne Waldman poems from the 1970s. Again, though, Samazic exploits this genre in a way that was only hinted at before. It is a mode that is at once welcoming and, and highly entertaining, though only it intermittently comprehensible in the standard sense. Humor is a constant ingredient as well, as in the page which has as its header in italics the abbreviation C-O-N-T, period. If you pronounce that aloud, it has a decidedly different meaning from the word originally italicized and abbreviated. In fact, you could say on a linguistic or hyperlinguistic level, Samazic has unabbreviated and unitalicized a word that, in its sudden revelation, elicits a smile with, along with much else. I hope that Stacy will be reading some of the poems from Hyperglossia tonight. Whatever she reads, I can guarantee you that she will stimulate your intellect, your senses, and your sensibility. Please welcome to Dia Stacy Samazic. Thank you, Vincent, and thank you to the entire DIA crew. Um, it's a pleasure and quite an honor to be here tonight. Um, th thank you for the survey of, of my work as an intro. I'm actually not reading from any of those pieces, unfortunately. Um, but they might be here. Are they here, Tracy? No, they're not here. <laughs> you can order them online at SPD. Oh, they are here. Okay, so they're, they are here. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to read some, some prose, which I, I don't do that often. I don't write prose that often, but um, I'm going to read this for Eileen, um, who shares my uh, at least interest uh, in the poet Hart Crane. And this is uh, uh, published by a uh, chapbook. Uh, it was a chapbook published by Faux Press uh, two years ago, and it's called Orizaba, A Voyage with Hart Crane. And it begins with a quote from him. In all the argosy of your bright hair, I dreamed nothing so flagless as this piracy. My interest in Hart Crane began as purely physical. I saw a picture of him when I was a young boy that gave my confused desires focus. He was wearing a Marseille sailor suit, leaning against a tree in Mexico with a dark-eyed woman named Peggy Cowley. None of this mattered at the time. It was his hair, which is cropped close on the sides and combed up in front. I acquired this hairstyle slowly, each cut coming closer to resemblance. In my mind, something forbidden was happening. When I asked my mother to buy me striped shirts from the mall, she seemed pleased that I was showing any interest in fashion. Not knowing what else to do, I copied what I liked about him. It is remarkable that a Hart Crane biography ever made it to our little public library. Voyager was being discharged and sold for a dime. Its 831 pages, including the index, was written by a man named John Unterrecker and published by Liverite, the same press that issued the trade edition of Crane's magnum opus, The Bridge. A previous reader had underlined a sentence on page 656, then in front of Orizaba, everything suddenly begins to change. Hart Crane had originally written this on a postcard. Hart Crane liked to write postcards to his friends. He wrote about deluxe editions, erratic millionaires, French gendarmes, and red pom-poms. His family still lived in Ohio. He signed his missives to them, Harold. I collect postcards. I don't travel much, but I enjoy befriending people who do. The cards are weathered, avidly perused by my hands, my current favorite on top, from an irascible blonde woman visiting Abu Dhabi who kissed me one New Year's Eve. Once Hart Crane wrote a postcard that began with possible lyrics for Bolero. This was after he heaved his phonograph out his window in upstate New York. He was a trying man to know, and this is another reason why he interests me. I have a lot to learn from people who don't question their privilege. I'm sure someone let, lent him money to buy a new phonograph, and he never paid them back, though this is not documented anywhere. I am not a trying man, 
though sometimes I do things that seem bold for my character. Growing up in the suburbs taught me to lead with a mild presence, or as it is commonly expressed, to fly under the radar. I have never spent a night in prison, but I have been questioned by the police. Hart Crane was in a French prison. He slapped a gendarme and 10 returned to work him over with a rubber hose. His friends Harry and Carice Crosby were waiting for him to finish the end of the bridge so they could publish it, Black Sun edition of 200 with another 50 autographed. But the guards wouldn't let him write. He memorized the order of the words he wanted to use and then told them to Harry. The SS Orizaba usually left its birth in the East River from Pier 4. I haven't mentioned the poetry of Hart Crane, which I read tentatively for many years after I discovered my attraction. I would steal in a phrase like, spry cordage of your bodies to caresses, and feel teeming, cockeyed, unable to continue. This also happened with Rimbaud and Mallarmé. It seems I couldn't read any of whom I deemed to be my favorite writers. I could wear striped shirts, but reading Hart Crane's small body of work, well, honestly, there are still poems I haven't gotten through. The Bridge is not my favorite poem. You may have heard of the Voyages sequence. This is my preference. Modern poetry tells us some things are cruel. April and the bottom of the sea. I'd have to agree, the bottom of the sea, where the Titanic, the Lusitania, and Hart Crane are lodged. Crane since April of 1932. Voyages was written when Hart Crane was in love with Emil Opfer Jr., a Danish sailor. I must have sensed that they were driven by the anguish of waiting, as I was waiting, to move to the city, to pursue my puzzling yet unequivocal attractions, to write a decent poem. When Emil docked, they walked across the Brooklyn Bridge holding hands. Is it less romantic when we are told that Emil Opford was not in love with Hart Crane, that he later moved back to Denmark and married? Voyages is the only extant document None of the letters between Hart Crane and his sailor lovers were ever found. Crane traveled from New York City to Mexico, Cuba, the Isle of Pines, making him a regular on the ship. I'm not psychologically a criminal, just as I'm not biologically a male. I am two things that historically align me with criminality, queer, and poet. Like I said, I've never been in trouble, but I'm always a suspect. My imagination became very powerful growing up under less than benevolent surroundings. I had to pretend. One of my first jobs was at a novelty shop that had an adult toy section. I didn't work there long, but the important thing is that I got a discount on a silver dildo with harness. I wore it locked in my bedroom while reading and writing until I felt my gravity center at my pelvis. For a long time, I only used it to penetrate myself. The first time I had sex was also the first time I fell in love, after I moved from the Midwest to New York, which somehow ended up being Poughkeepsie. She was five years older than me, and my youth didn't interest her at first. She asked me if I had any lip balm, and I put some on myself and kissed her. Things like this made her feel ambivalent toward me. <laughs> I pursued her with our mutual passion for literature. She let me into her attic room after I read from Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, a modern library edition purchased from Gotham Bookmark. I haven't felt inclined to move the bookmark from the page where, in seducing her, I lost my virginity. I understand why Hart Crane wanted to marry Peggy Cowley. It was his last effort to recapture the brand of middle-class life he was born into, and her companionship was a consolation to the loneliness that he said had about eaten him up. When he was drunk, he would denounce her and their fledgling household in Mexico. I tried to form a middle-class household with another woman who must have reminded me of my mother. One night, I walked into the bathroom and saw her head bowed, waxing the dark hair from her legs. Right then, I knew how our story would end, but decided to stick around and see it through. Some people felt that Peggy's presence in Hart Crane's life drove him to his death. Others said she just hastened the inevitable. He sat in his deck chair all in white, drinking cordials in the morning, waiting for his friends to wake up. Hart Crane's mother's name was Grace, 
She used him in the absence of her business, business man, businessman husband, C.A., for a kind of emotional support inappropriate for a mother-child relationship. One night, while vacationing on the Isle of Pines together, she woke Hart Crane up, told him that there were cows roaming around the plantation, and asked him to shush them away. Before he went out into the darkness, he swallowed 18 packets of Grace's sleeping powder. On the same vacation, he cut his wrists. 18 years later, in Mexico, he swallowed a bottle of mercuricum, but Peggy knocked his hand away and called for the doctor to administer an emetic. In Mexico, attempted suicide is a crime. With all the other trouble he had caused, his Guggenheim at an end, it was best to leave. Days later, on the way back to New York, he jumped over the side of the Orizaba into the Atlantic Ocean, delivering us his last words. I'm utterly disgraced. Passenger Gertrude Vogt said he folded his top coat over the railing before he jumped. He was wearing it over his pajamas. It was high noon. He had spent the night nailed into his room by the purser because he was drunk and trying to make it with the men. There was some evidence that he had been roughed up, too. He didn't jump, really. He vaulted. I think Hart Crane knew he was never going to marry Peggy Cowley. She was the most stable relationship in his life, but most bio biographers agree that the most important was with Emil Opfer Jr., the relationship we know next to nothing about. When he was drunk, he would accuse Peggy of trying to reform him and then go find a Mexican boy to spend the night with. When she felt the ship stop, she knew what he had done. Soon they would be pedestrians in a city with pastel-tinted buildings. I wrote three poems to Hart Crane that were published as a broadside by the Heavy Duty Press, 2000, in an edition of 100. I was more guarded about my influences then, so I'd like to reprint them here with a dedication added. Three poems for Hart Crane. My sail compasses known longitude of a blackened swell, an Atlantic blow. Midnight's artificial surface recollects a search, pajamas, head first, pinstriped. Oceanic amulets digested, keep me equivocal. Belongings never recovered, propellers. Seaside holiday, I am peninsular, suitcase of biographies, watery love life. I read these poems at an open reading and alluded to my love for Hart Crane. My hair was newly shorn and I had on my best trousers. My male peers in the audience responded with enthusiasm and a few invited me over to see their poetry chapbook collections. The implications were erotically inspirational. Within a week, I had picked up a man I thought was gay, but he was unnerved the next morning when I asked him if he had ever been with a woman before. I still haven't found a relationship that works for me. For a while, I had a gas station attendant jacket that had the name Butch stitched on the pocket in gold thread. I was wearing it when I met a woman who liked to hang around poets. She wore skirts, carried a real purse, and read everything I recommended to her. Sometimes my calm and focused exterior is seen as aloof, so women who like to fight for attention to be paid to them fall for me. We were together for three months till she begrudged me my refusal of authority and stopped visiting my fifth floor walk up with a view of Manhattan. Okay. For the past couple of years, I've been working on a, a book length poem entitled Heart Island. And some of you may know um, that Heart Island is, I think, the, possibly the world, uh, the world's, if not the country's largest potter, potter's field. So uh, itinerant people in New York City uh, end up uh, on Heart Island, which is in the Long Island Sound. The thing that's unique about it is it's a tax-funded cemetery, but it's also um, tended to by prisoners uh, who are uh, imprisoned in Rikers Island. So it's not accessible to the public. Um, but it's not really a poem about Heart Island. It's kind of there looming in the, in the, in the background as a, a presence. And it, really, the poem began as a way 
for me to um, write while holding a pretty psychically um, demanding job and uh, or psychically consuming job and uh, um, it acts as a, a bit of a day book for uh, my time on Second Avenue and at the Poetry Project um, and a way to deal with my own mortality and morbidity, I guess. Another thing to know is that um, one of the things that's happening in this poem is that there's an index and there's a, uh, the index has lines from poems that have been read at the Poetry Project and one of the constraints I put on myself is I have to be present and I have to write down the line when I hear it. So some of the lines you're, you'll hear, I'll tell you now. Um, there's a line from Frank O'Hara, read by Robert Gluck. A line from Leland Hickman, read by Marjorie Wellish. A line from Bob Kaufman, read by Will Alexander. A line by Steve Evans. James Schuyler, read by Ann Waldman. Uh, Laura Moriarty and Ben Estes. And it's three sections, uh, and I'm going to read a little bit from each section. This is 2008-2009. A cavern, hill, side, hazel, eye, carnation, face, nasal, call, a drake. Messianic chemical reaction, scourge, marks of the lot, lit, infra, red, winding, paper, napkin, turin. Scout in December when DNA is a frozen box of letters, a poorly insulated midlife apartment, empty condo, views, bake, a pie to test, the oven, drape, moves, extra mundane. The F, financial advisor, by itinerant limbs, I mean free of circulation, plods and plots, I lie. Rate of interest in disease is not hypochondria. Hypothyroid feet are cold plugs. Grip portfolio, expound line item. No 401k, no Ponzi. A woman applied for a dis. A woman applied for a disinterment. Heart island chaperone leads her to. He calleth his own by name. Manifest with a number she chews. The mouth has to go dry, a rose, a day, a congenital day. Small pine, grid, crown, skyline, this form where I feel love for babies, Catholic and regular. Then SCB1 1985, separate and deeper than yellow fevers. The polity around visitation through Rikers, inmates in Tur, dead matter, easy duty, brought back to community. The avenue downtown, quality of leg, pain, predictor of blood clot, church clock still broke, will work for poets. Crane, agora, frosted eyes lift, altars along the eastern seaboard and Melville's in the Bronx, parts of Don Powell, science didn't use, her executrix refused, the field claims. Coffee and kasha, coffee light and kasha with gravy or borscht, hot or cold smiles at me, everyone who works here on the avenue. The other is another literal body. Oh, limit and radiance we breathe. The heated mousy dust in the church love nest. This is from section two, 2009, 2010. Someone left the bolt unlocked, but he played Midnight Sentinel with his book. I closed my eyes, and dozens of poets were unable to speak. This sapling restores an aura of dignity. Down here, there is possibility. Dead wood isn't dead. Figures swim together. My claws don't rush to fill you for a second fall in love with the light. You'll eat bread till you return to the ground, fingerless, 
gloves, fingertips around hot paper, cup, you doubters, you steam flows from the theater of my ribs, where it dragged a compass to retrace my area, an army of those who survived themselves to find ecstasy as breath tinged with a story, how I would offer it to anyone tonight. Recused in hallway just happen stance, a man just expects to find warmth in a church. He'll search for her in five hospitals, follow her epileptic path, extended mass of her body, let's degrade the space between us. The alcohol gets inside a space heater in Siberia, mesh becomes exposed, just one part piled on another. How a body becomes unwanted, yet everywhere touched, buried in married memories. Index starting with ear, how an ear becomes unwanted and wears that indignation, whereas hand hides its information, how a hand becomes unwanted and works a hoe with steady pulse, it is unwanted. The cargo of bodies cross the Long Island Sound. Who's under whose wing make a pantomime of loss? Someone made aspiration a new arm from sticks and paper, mache. He's holding a bouquet, so furtive. This is flip phone to flip phone, only a white whale away. Here is my card, I am not working, is what I will say. Here is my card, I am not working today. Wish friends would repopulate quickly as the fields. Non-conflict with annual day of the dead, homecoming women with soft brushes, clean birthday on famed stone, not an active crack, restricted to its two halves. Extension cords hang from pear branch. That is how water is boiled for food. So many people's people extend into brass, smoke break in shade, bodies spaced by workers. Is the earth as full as life was full of them? Walk up avenue with memory, circling regime, query the polyclinic, supposed to be very old, but that is the effect of maelstrom, felt as a douche on the mood of a divided city. One can adjust to anything, a child's filled teeth timed to destruct post-coverage, a pile of lime, not calm of a site where a thing was settled but flooded with hinged creatures. Too much information shuns a history of objection. When she said, we don't want to bleed you, but I myself was bled. After long engagement with antisocial dart about as sparks through stubble when obvious he is history, scent of pine, scent of pine surrounding drugstore, a story, problem with subjective math, laugh of the day, arrest, I need a rest. Fountain would be closer than damaged bath, card and ordeal to relax with true feelings of commune, blinking lights at Sing Sing, the princess of darkness has a mafia style, morning routine, food smells from the kitchen, prepared containers for disappearance, note from my anatomy, we won't forget how livable you were. Bell hammer set to arouse city inhabitants with sorrow. Linen clad Catholic imposes ash plus oil, wherefore I abhor myself for one lie. We agree, enter the storefront, sold into solitude ring. Winter sun glare metals that define the breast, the epitome of employer at morning civil twilight, all body language now on the avenue. Crocodile tears for the unnamed dead lures the press. What is death without a ditch? What is life without a sudden pillow dreamed that all attributes once held in our hands were gnawed off by our own fangs? We all smiled into each other's eyes, the patron for orchards, the patron for running water. We all prayed to you for passage to Avignon. Work 24 hour 
A day shifts, lead not to the good life, will wash once a day, reliquary arm with window to the past, crow perches on, child drops message and wipes out, will wash twice a day, woman denied clearance for closure visit, use the state of our health, our teeth, our tongue, to read list with refrain of what the archive is, male, unknown, iron mouthfeel will wash three times a day, stripped from the source, how long till you are on your way with your clean case history. The roses weren't in the lion's mouth, then they were. People gather for food, pantry, enough ego here to lend to each psychotic, candles lit inside, seedy side of serving God, Today broke into a sweat at doll cart, late spring rain walk on stones, a crop of shellfish, can't be afraid of pigeons or punks. The beer can wasn't in the lion's mouth than it was. If I lived here, I'd be home, dirty undershirt and flower pot, even though I hate the village. If place of death is whited out, select redacted. If subway, select unique. Word like something stands in for what possesses bypassers to laugh. Mystery, everyone is reading. Plot, ready as weather. Slow to process this blue. If under an overpass, select unique. A single person is missing, further excluded from the heart of the city. No one has the right to say the world is empty. and just a few from 2010, 2011, which is where we are now. Eat less and from a tent, eat, le eat less and from a tin, floss caught between two fillings, observe my obsession, feel new, hair long in your valley of death, kick the can, dress in white and sing, take this head-shaped oh. onion and replicate and wax, layered in notebooks, meat at boiler, first day at fires, feast day of Cosmos and Damien. Take pill on full stomach, polish milk out of boots. When I grow up, it won't be pretty. Intensity restored in analysis. Hide from our family's deposit documentary mass and short bios. Clove smiles on oranges. Pomegranate halves with glitter stars. Because we were fastened only approximately parochially, the fiddler emerges from the trees. Make fun of to-do list, get pot, soak beans. Imagine a New Year's Eve without hot water bottle. Pocket Mrs. Dalloway, search for own golden, search for own golden lion head cufflinks with ruby eyes. Anthropomorphize into another cat, fight for most cloaks. Deduct flowers from petty cash, look into dirty kiosk for proper names, wait on bench. 1,642 bodies aroused by bloodshot eyes say the poets will keep guard over us who live with our bodies. Day of the dead, crowned sugar skulls promiscuously melt in living mouth, typed list, threw it out, blue tarp done, away with, standing on a Dutchman. If I hug you any closer, I'll be behind you. Funnier today than when I crushed your tamales. The horror of being conjoined and losing your weight and sister calls for split screen effects. Pre-Superman, Margot afraid of being stabbed or crushed by an AC, sirens down the avenue. So often we clasp our ears. Reference card table and chairs to confusion. First pull of beer, watching dimes pile up. Can't get a game going. Lead with forelock, grime mixed with bay rum and roses. You grow till you get hit. Then always trying to form a pack. Get a game going. Shuffle like the old poles taught you. Psychological commitment of that test result, I fail. The mission, shred the wrists of unhappiness, replace fat with wool, surplus, blood, spun, footage safe and cold vault. Can't see own hump, but will play hunch 
back or crow Pluto till the law of sanctuary is vetoed. Neck open to sky with smooth board, slide down at sundown to the interred, how often to be buried, a passing valediction. Thank you very much for listening. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Eileen Miles. Eileen Miles was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1949, was educated in Catholic schools growing up in Arlington, and graduated from UMass Boston in 1971. She moved to New York in 1974, gave her first reading at CBGB, and then went on to study with Ted Berrigan, Alice Notley, and Paul Violi at the Poetry Project. She edited Dodgem's Magazine during 1977 to 79, which was, as she puts it, quote, a poetry magazine which presented a collision of New York School language poetry, performance texts, and other likely aesthetics of the time. She was the director of the Poetry Project from 1984 to 86. Her first three books of poems were striking entries in the annals of poet-run presses. The Irony of the Leash, I love these titles too, by the way. The Irony of the Leash, 1978, Jim Brody Books. A Fresh Young Voice from the Plains, 1981, Power Med Books, published by Barbara Barg. And Sappho's Boat, Little Caesar Press, 1982, published by Dennis Cooper. Not Me was published by Semio Text in 1991. Miles published three books of poems with Black Sparrow Press, Maxfield Parish, 1995, School of Fish, 1997, and Skies, 2001. Her most recent book of poems is Sorry Tree, 2007, from Wave Books. She's also published a book of stories, two novels, most recently Inferno from Orr Books, and The Importance of Being Iceland, Travel Essays in Art from Semiotext. In 2010, the Poetry Society of America awarded Miles the Shelley Prize. Eileen Miles is ever glamorous. I love the fine line between invented and discovered. Eileen is almost always there. She invented or discovered herself, we find, by reading her poetry and prose. And she became an icon as a kind, as a kind of writer we didn't know we needed, though we might have predicted it had we been able to think ahead. There's a lot of Eileen at home in her poems, her apartments, her dogs, her lovers, her broccoli. So this is a poetry of daily life, but not daily life as Frank O'Hara envisioned it, Ty flapping happily over his shoulder as he buys a hot dog on Fifth Avenue on his lunch break. Miles' daily life begins in her earliest book, lyrically, but hesitantly, quote, sort of thought I'd hear from you. I thought, well, he'll either be in the same mood or different, from the poem Homebody, from the irony of the leash. However, there's another poem from the same book that shows a different aspect of Miles' poetry, a consciousness that is constantly searching in words for patterns to realize itself. Quote, this is why it rains today. Green always requires a form, nudging selves from inner chambers. Hospital rooms would pretend some calm, from the poem Green. A gathering sense of the body, a woman's body, appears, quote, I feel one tit, well, I feel two, from dawn, and it never goes away. This sense is sensual in a ravishing way, directly limbing desire, that is, a woman's graphic desire for the bodies of other women. A political consciousness also appears, as in her poem, on the death of Robert Lowell, which begins, quote, oh, I don't give a shit. He was an old white-haired man. 
She sometimes goes back to her Irish Catholic neighborhood in Arlington, often with great tenderness and empathy, though she holds her parents accountable. She gets larger. She attacks the big topics like poetry. Poem on the profession begins, quote, language interests me more than life. She really hit her stride in Not Me, written in 1986 to 89. That was when she invented a self for herself in, quote, an American poem by mixing reality and satire. Quote, I hopped on an Amtrak to New York in the early 70s, and I guess you could say my hidden years began. I thought, well, I'll be a poet. What could be more foolish and obscure? But later in the poem, she writes, quote, yes, I am. I am a Kennedy. My attempts to remain obscure have not served me well. <laughs> quote, Poets are, by their nature, obscure, but Miles has not attempted to remain obscure, and she is anything but. She has become a spokesperson for a generation, or generations, as when she writes, quote, that might be all we invented this year. It's great that we did one single thing to be different, quote. Still later, Eileen became a nature poet, writing about forests and dedicating a whole book of poems to the sky, or skies. Her use of language, line breaks, punctuation, shifts of subject is unpredictable. Where she'll travel next, we don't know. But we do know one thing, she will be great. Please welcome Eileen Miles. Thank you, Vincent. I hope I don't suck. <laughs> I suck. And I didn't know that about the puppets. I thought you told me to do a poet. I have incredible puppets that I, I made when I was like eight. And I'm actually, my next memoir, not that I've ever written a memoir before, but my next memoir, this, I have a whole scene for the puppets converse with my dead dog. It's like a really great scene. You think I'm kidding, I'm not. <laughs> it's like, so I'm going to read, I guess I'll read um, one teeny little bit from my poet's novel, um, I guess about poetry readings, and then I'll read poetry. You know, it's all poetry, right? The puppetry, the... the um. Yeah, and this is actually, this is from the scene, the scene of, of doing a poetry reading, and um, the, the narrator is doing a poetry reading in 1977, and she suddenly finds herself a lesbian, shockingly, and those are the poems she's reading. I did a love reading, that's all. It wasn't that I didn't care about poetry anymore, it was just that I had been transplanted into another realm. I opened my mouth and cried about how beautiful love was, how confused I was, the sky held me like a hero. I feel one tit. Well, I feel too. How cold it was to be up all night alone, thinking about a woman while the morning turned blue. I was burning. It was like I took a bolt of lightning and stabbed the world. And I was still shaking from the attack. Later, one of the guys whose workshops I was in, Bill Zavatsky, told me that my poems were second-rate Sappho. <laughs> I was stunned, but you know, I could have cared less. It was what I was in. Later on, I published those poems as Sappho's bow to make damn sure everyone knew what I meant. But look, I'll show you the page. The thing that happened in the new poems is this feeling I had that Sappho was like an overhead view of water across which something had moved. And you could see it like this. Dip your finger into the water, causing a spiral. And how would you preserve a pattern like that? It would be to pick points along the swirling line, almost like a constellation, that would simply indicate the movement without representing every little bit. It would be sort of like leaning in occasionally to say that you were there. I imagined skiing, which I had done some when I was a kid, not well. How your hips moved in relation to the grade, shifting your weight to keep the slope. To say in some gravitational way, you would use all the things that poems have, words and lines and stanzas, but all of it would be pulsing. The poem would get fat for a moment, then it would trickle and stop, picking up over here or down there. It really did look like a sky, I thought, the falling structure of a poem. And I had a manual typewriter then, not even electric, so I'd write a stanza and fling the carriage, and it would stop more or less there, a few lines down, and I'd pick it up again. 
Forgetting the fact of typewriting, you do lose how much moving down a page was like sailing. The machine actually did stop and got to work right there like a drill. And then it's moving over the white page, beginning again when you stop flicking the roll that held the paper. And all of this was sound. The machine clicking and whirling and ringing too, and the paper, it's hard scraping clack. And the white out, the smell and the spray of it on your clothes, black jeans with faded white spots. I wore them that night, but all I felt was drunk. As I watched the event loom, I, all I hoped was that I would not get too drunk before I read. And I was successful. I was presently in it. Knowledge stood up and crowed. When you are reading, your throat gets dry. Your lips and mouth are only putting out. They need a river. So you pick up your bottle, and there's such peace in the world, just you swallowing. And that can be horrible, so you tilt your head a little bit. <laughs> I never think of getting decapitated, having my throat slit. But in some way, during these most vulnerable moments of the reading, the silence, the in-between, you do give the audience your throat. You can't look them in the eye when you swallow. That would be suicide. So you turn a little aside and absorb the room's silence. That's what you are drinking. The poem is turning, too. Ever since the time when poets were reciting, not looking down at all, looking deeply into their own memories and reading or re-experiencing, and later when people did start writing the thing down, it was a prose record, a literal recording, not wanting to make something happen on the page, instead just a way to hold it. The words still a pump from the poets inside, pumping blind. And now these little containers, things that tell us from so many centuries ago, ancient broken pots. By the time I got my hands on one, when that occurred, I just sort of wanted to cuff the white space of it, you know, knock it around. It was the only way to produce the kind of glancing and wincing and exclaiming, to produce a world of so many surfaces wider than a book. The world's pouring would have to be a curve. The line would be running, cursive, infinity, a fight. The words needed to splinter off in some way just to describe it so that any one poem would be a surge and nothing more, an intrepid break in time. That's how you do it. <laughs> so, and I, I love Stacy and her work, so that was so great. I wrote a poem. It's called Little Brother. <laughs> God today broke into a sweat. I just quoted Stacy Semasek. <laughs> right? <laughs> We discussed outfits, we discussed <laughs> script, we were like coordinating and discoordinating all day today. Oh. No excuse, the crows were never here, I don't remember them, and you could put your hand in the water and hit a fish or two. Now you gotta go look. She was the first one from India to outer space. I don't remember those trees and I don't remember it being so hot. But winter used to be really cold, you remember that? I know to hold back tends to keep the thing going, but I don't like it. But I don't. I like it kind of square, all there. We played the reading at Gallery 6. Maybe it was his description of it. We read it in class. Some things get saved. I like to return. I like the farmer who studied science, came home and make it made it work. He was Japanese. He stabbed himself right in the chest, like Elliot, not Kurt. The two kinds of death are different. Of all the songs you ever wrote, you wrote some. Guy in the airport reading about farming, thick thighs, and he looked like a businessman, and that's what farmers look like today. He was trying to get better to improve his lot. This immense restlessness on the plane. Remembering Ray thought the birds had changed and something else. And Peter said the fish were practically everywhere and now they're not. I don't know myself and that's a sin. Your name. It's very hard to hunt from indoors, I'll say that for you. And text is at best an attenuated warning. Sound has a range of many desires, not just map. I subscribe to the Grandpa Bunny Bunny School of Theory. I mean Genesis to write as a form of accounting, an approximate promise in the sunny mouth of time, a horny bet, or else hunters lolling around the fire. What did you get? How can we avoid it, this making a speech, long-limbed and maybe in July? Aren't we lucky to have captured each other in this hideous neon light? Caesarean toothbrush for Alice. Which is like the most hideous title of all time, right? <laughs> it, was, it was only to amuse Alice Notley. <laughs> what it was, I mean, every time I read the poem, I tell the story, it's sort of gross, but I had, you know, when a tube of toothpaste starts squirting from the side, 
You know this, right? And so every night, and you stop unscrewing it, and every night you br go to brush your teeth, and you think, Caesarean toothpaste, huh? Like, you know, so but Caesarean toothbrush sounds better. I left it outside for a yuck for those that we know who may never come in, but riding by, they'll know what I'm doing. They will know I'm okay. It's what we want to know about everything. We don't want to get sprayed by it. More than once it's been suggested to me that if I look more closely, I'd see that it's normal. So I live with weird but familiar. To traffic, it looks okay. My jokes are mostly traveler's jokes. I go to unusual lanes to get what most people get. In my defense, I like it hard. My cat's name is Marco Polo. His severe profile gazing into the dead end of the apartment. Hey, that's not going out. That end goes out. To him, I just become invisible for a while, and to me, that's just my life. This is being his secretary, worrying about how he'll be when he'll be anything. Worry about yourself, Eileen, stabbing things. I just did do it for a very long time, in that motion, in that soothing motion. Computer. I'm not even a boat. I'm where a boat crashed. I put my impossible body in your hands. Is this a pen? <laughs> These are all technological poems. This one. This one's called Transitions. Sometimes I'm driving and I press the, bu the button to see who called and suddenly I'm taking pictures. <laughs> Big dark ones. He says it's not about where you sit to make a film, but I wasn't taking a picture. I was driving and it's black and all, there's all these lights. I'm strong. It's night and I've driven very far. I keep hearing the music of the weekend. He says it's not about whether she and I resume. It's about how it all goes on with me. In my car so long ago, I loved someone who read me a poem on the phone about the car of the day. You mean the one I'm driving and the fact that she left it on the phone? And that was new. She said I was overreacting and that was too much. And we sent our messages in light and ack. She hated trees. I thought she's so young because I like nature now. And her trunk wrapped around me one day. He licks my arm, my boy. And driving home, I thought, if he dies, I will see his paw in the sky. And I'm always seeing it now. And she's home going, hoo And she said, I love our little meeting. I said, little? Don't denigrate my need to support, my need to say that you can. I'm glad I'm home. It's wide out there. We spoke about scaffolding, him fitting the flame, him fitting the frame to the eye. She's grown, I wanted to say. We laugh about Tang, and later on the toilet thought about Tango and Joan, El Tango Larkin. What's not technology? What's not seeing? An arm to say, I hold the line, I hold the day, I watch the snowflake melting. Hi, for Steve Carey, who was a great selected, right? And he just was a great lover of women and sex. And it just inspired me to write a dirty poem. <laughs> you made me smell. I didn't smell at all before I met you. Smells are pouring out of my clothes, feet, my socks, my hair. This is gross. You've made me monstrous, and I love it. I knew a man who laughed at himself for being this way, stinking of love. It was what he was, a stinking factory of his love, lying there all day, going out to get a smoke. I'm the East Coast version of that since I met you, since the era of my famous resistance to you ended. It began like the wind. I'm a window to the world. The mailman can see me. He waves. Children out there playing. It's even this way when I'm out there, except when I hold your hand. I want it to be this exception. I've become not a woman or man. The heart pumps. The man is dead, and it's spring. It's a smelly season, don't you think? The earth knows the bugs are beginning to look around. You're throwing your mother's old stuff out. Your friends are beginning to understand. I want to show mine something different, the ripples I've become. I'm influenced, the way language changes, rocks heal and burn, meat stretches. Your little round animal face keeps coming around the corner, but oh no, now you're coming down. I'm looking up. Um, the she in this is my dear late dog, Rosie. Day. She perceives light as a paint by number, leaping into a dark two. I join in a puddle to the hump of her breathing, her sharing the air. It's everywhere with her, her abdomen bobbing as she stands looking at the fence ground, the splay of the light. Her wonderful ass sits down. Earlier, I ascribed her feeling to joy, number one, or else three, birds, eight, her pink tongue, four, darker underneath, seven, the birds sounding like nine, in a brown tree over there, living or dying in the blue air. Questions. 
I may not have the time for all of this, but A, I enjoy the slap of my flip-flops on the stair. And though my name is not Roxanne, I remember when I would have liked that, a girl playing witch in her yard with jars and spiders, webs, and the world was misty. A, almost took it all. Even if I'm not Roxanne, I know you like my voice in the dark, and I did too. B, rabbits like to be up and around at twilight and dust exactly when I get scared. Did stripe, stripes come from any place else in nature but a changing sky and a sad parent fills a room and before a child can think she feels it too? C, the tree. There was a moment of light before I got in the car. The tree was that green that holds up the procession of this. It is the world. D, and now I will drive home. I looked at a lamp light just for a sec. Could Eileen ever be Roxanne? No. my monster. And um, I, I keep v missing, I keep wanting to see Zizak, and I keep missing him in cities all over the world. I'm like, Zizak's, Zizak's here again, but no, I have to do a reading. And I'm sort of desperate to see the guy, but I, so I watched the video, Zizak. And the one thing I loved about it was um, his blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> it was like, you remember when people started to say blah, blah, blah? And then, and it, which, but European people go blah, blah, blah. And I thought, my monster. Dry cleaners never have to worry about their sign. The worse it gets, the cleaner people think their clothes will be. Do you see my choice? Sometimes you have to slow down or speed up to fart. The revolution is still occurring in the body. I want to go home is what you say out the window. Just when I had nothing to say, I heard his blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, I'll say something else. I want to be in it. You might think I'm ignoring you, but that's what's happening. I'm in you, blah, blah, blah. It's hot. She might see them as pimples on his ass, but he sees them as allergic jewels. <laughs> At night in Iceland, Haraldar goes out to gather a box of darkness. They have more time if you think of it. That's why Christine emails me more when I'm here. What's between us is countries, which is nothing now. I say love, blah, blah, blah. I say love. Globe. To have a child, to call them Micron. Guess what I'm not doing? I have health insurance, raise my hand, though not through a parent, cat behind a screen, but will not share. It seemed, it seemed right at, at the time. Okay, this is for P-Town people. It's called Howland. And the only thing, you don't need to know this, but it's interesting. There was, I, there's a guy in it named Kenny, and he's like the town crier, so he walks around in a pilgrim outfit. And John Waters borrowed it for him, and he was so excited, because I think he thought he was going to be in a John Waters movie, but John was just like making art and using Kenny's costume, so. Howland. Stephen was a servant, Stephen Howland. If you've read the book Mayflower, this would all make much more sense to you. Yeah. Stephen was a servant. That wind out there says more. Aporia, my speech is disturbing. The one million tourists in the street today. Kenny, prior to your move to Charles River Park, you lived in Somerville, is that correct? Debbie said I had a knot in my neck. Language is not greedy. She rubbed it, and Ryan's play became illuminated. Ryan lives in Dorchester. Is that true? Yes, it is. I wonder if this would be better without sound. The first poem I made in that way. Stephen had no sea legs, fell off the boat. Fortunately, a halyard was lowered, and Stephen was raised to safety. I read this on the couch. At which point do you think his name was attached to this street? The pilgrims only lived here a couple of months. Ask Kenny, my desire to go to the beach has been curtailed. You're all on your vacation, everyone. The word halyard is in my vocabulary, nearly broke because of my recent interest in sailing, my time in a boat with Abby Swan, the name of my street in the town, not Provincetown, and this name belonging to a king. Hither Hill is another story, your outfit in John's movie, and Dorothy Bradford threw herself right off the boat. It's long, but I don't know if you really want to hear it. Um, okay. Um, Chris, I told my therapist about the fire, I guess, in New York. They told the landlord there were five of them, but it was 11. Practically all of them died. There was a picture of one woman crying. Some were her kids. It's impossible to know where the fray of bright red cloth came from on the grass. If the power's off for a second, it's fun. Better is the second it all starts coming on, fans whirring, radio, everything. 
We landed ourselves on a grassy slope with a view of the freeway, the rushing sound of it, her familiar black back with the shav shaved part around her ass, a hot spot, her white muzzle turns, watching, guiding her away from the family with my knee, coffee in my hand, on the telephone. The family watched their baby ti tiny in red, wandering, pray for my dog. I feed her treats, guide her to another angle. Surely it's layered, the skin of day, chirping, Fanny, you're maternal. Well, I have three kids, they told me to talk to Jesus, which I thank for my interiority. They told me to guard Jesus for one full hour, in which I began to seize time by waiting. The bird is like something you squeeze, squeaking. Give us facts. My home, ne home never burned, and I'm one. The loss would be minor. How big would I get as I turn the pages, measuring the size of the dead? I followed her shaking head. Next quarter, I intend to teach them everything, whereas this quarter, I taught them to grow up in a mess. I did. The year is new. I'm back. The cat's bed is not my bed. Mat on the floor. The real resists, but is it at the same time its own spotted retroactive bed? The scratching and picking after the whacking, but I have come to recognize my enjoyment. The humming's gone. I'm back. I dwell. A.D. Donna Bender sent me a JPEG called Ernie and Nika. It's all stripes. I mean, no dog, no cat, just a horizontal television Agnes Martin of red, pale, blue, and black. Nice, because Ernie's now nestled at the back of my spine, construction outside and trees waving. Guess I should be writing like that, not this sorry, sorry report, enjoying the pause of nothing being what sh it should. Love is. Mitten. You know, you think it's going to be about a mitten, but it's actually a German word that means in the middle. Right. We're global. We can handle it. We can, we can take the weight. Right. It's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful here, but the thing is, it is beautiful. The peach sky is beautiful and black outlines of the branches and the leaves. Look, I even hesitate, but it doesn't matter if it all comes at once or breaks down slow. Catch this honking or the rumbling of the world. Last night in different streets, which I didn't bother to write, I made the point that it's great where you are, too. The places are connected and boom, boom, rumble. All the places are connected, thus the endless beauty. And I have been beaten and suffered, and you have, too. Whoop, whoop. Listen to that. Someone getting arrested. Someone caught. Someone's heart just stopped. Someone else holding the bag. I wrote something else about the day holding me and me holding you. A car passes like a big breath. It's what I've got, all these things, and I hand them to you like sex in the city. My ideal, our endless sound, our connection. Listen to all your voices now. I've actually gotten very good at this. I feel like Joan of Arc when I do it now. <laughs> kind of. I mean, the drinking the water, not the poetry reading. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect faceless fish. This is puppetry. This is pure. This is the puppet part of the. Just picture the fish. It is a miracle that I should speak to delight you. I feel like a flag, more or less, but music is my breeze. I have many friends, rest assured. You have given me my water, and for this I must thank you. You have been described as elegant in your time, and it is wrong. It is long, the road to go. I am, a <laughs> I am honored to accompany you. A pitcher is simply what I am, an old crease, a perfect book. You will miss me in your sterile anticipation of something to hang this pitcher on. I come and go an edible saint, but if you feast on me, you will be hungry. I know your intelligence carnal somehow, and I began to speak when you began to want me. Please don't interrupt. I cross my legs. I flood the darkened rooms of art for a while, and frankly, that moment is gone. We could only talk through our eyes, and now that is gone. But this is deeper than the marrow. We don't need rods, cones, those Sanskrit piles of things. I am seeing through a stain right now in your love. I am swimming for years. In a sudden absence of trouble and a deftly handled conversation, I, a luminous fish, felt in this spectacle of impossibility a fragrant graze upon the world, an intermittent twitch, whisper. If I had hands, I would touch everyone. I vanish in the green of the background that goes on and on, made by those who recognize it that way. There's always something better to do. I live in a terminal, and so do you. 
Listen, we are trying to end everything by this enormous silence, brief, but it was the old thing, so it shall be very loud, very loudish in the squabbles we have about right and wrong and where the flagpole is and do we ever, will we ever have enough space to play the game? I am deeply knowing you and feel you have chosen me for this conversation before it's cooked, before anything is prepared, anything at all. The lesser details, never mind the first exquisite choice that brought me into being, this conversation, a fishy birth. I've had you in my pocket. It's all that I know. But a knowing that is useless without this acknowledgement in a many-chambered room. Ew, is that what you said? Enormous, darkly, I accept it. I flow around and fold into everything your comic desultory con desultory contempt, which I'm beginning to think functions as glue for you. The prettiness for me is the opening city and moving through it with you, the young old fold around your mouth, seismic, trust that. I am gold in the reconciliation, gold in the anticipation, paradise, great ambiance. What's available is not of any use to what is me today, a stoic longing symbol of studying peace in outlandish quarters. Your long room in the night, your whole long body, which is faceless too, to acquire your trust is of utmost importance to me. I am foolish, I, talking fish. The time is here for me to make promises to you that is sometimes standing in a bakery. Laughing becomes a professional wife with empty folders. And I see the muscle embedded, the one that can't be removed, in the beloved text that is offered, a torso-sized drink to me. Each time I break the surface, turn around, bubbles cascading from the incommensurate path of my tail, tentacle, limbs. You make me enough so I hold a cup, gasping with laughter, in the t-shirts covered with arcane scribbles, carry the message, awkward grins and phones to their ears. Yours are wired to everything there is. You're an impossible telephone. I lift my head for the last sip of your, ew. A lamb leaps over the fence, the arms I would have, we would hold each other. In. I am waiting. No difficulty with gold. As I told your mother, I have obtained access to an uncontrolled intimacy. Fear not. Certainly I did not phrase it like that. But I met her in the most advanced communication terrain and exchanged messages concerning our difficulties with God and man. I'm beginning to know I am gold, a transforming ship, the clipped end of an utterance I was saving for you when I saw your swinging light, the door approach, and everything moves close. I kind of shot my wad, now I have to sort of unshoot it. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Got about 10 minutes. Um, this is Smile. It's a happy poem. Uh, it's just not as much fun without a good knife, without a good light and a sharp knife. I mean, leaning into the peach of it, People find the time to get their sharpened or use yours. That drip in the kitchen is like someone I know. Today's cold is an affirmation of the purchase of yesterday's new shirt. I mean, I knew the cold would come sometime, but today? I'm wearing that drip most of all. My half-made meal and even the space that surrounds the incredible possibility of hunger on and on like my favorite man, Frankenstein. The drip has tones, a relationship with the holding bowl that is only holding water. All these rhymes all the time. I used to think Mark Wahlberg was family. So was Tim, but close to his, his death, he told me he was adopted. Every time he smiled, he thought, Eileen is a fool, or that's what love looks like. If I woke and my master was horrified, I would go out into the world with this enormous hurt, and I have carried mine for so long, I now know it's nothing special. It's just the fall and the sound of her sirens. It's the agony of being human, not a dog who dies maybe six times in the lives of her masters. Everyone's phony and made up. Everyone's a monster like me. Now I know everyone. The cat is in the bag. I leave the bag where it is so the cat can get in it and dream for a very long time while the rest of my building purrs. He slipped his head into the bag's handles and gently sniffs it. Well then, money. Well then, love. The movie. This is based on my research with the, of the Polish director, um, Andrzej Wajda. He's like a train station. It's too late to go duck hunting. At last he woke up, sits on blankets with young girls. Can you stand it? He does not miss life now in its secondary summer, the lateness of his first kiss. November 11th. It's not just that the clock 
stopped or reversed, but just seemed to change itself. I remember a procession of sweet buildings boarded up, finding him in a store, then kissing in the rain, the strange pleasure of pleasing someone, me, then my godmother, and then someone jumping off a building in the rain, the surprise and the sound of rain on the phone, holding it for a while. Um, this is a whole passionate sequence. I'm just reading the two best from a whole sequence of poems to my great love, Diet Coke. <laughs> Diet Coke. I admit you are buying all the water in the world, and then you will sell it back to us as water. The airlines are accepting these free napkins that all say Coke. Everything suggests you are good, except that you are stealing our thirst by selling it back to us, replacing our bodies with you. I did stop drinking you for a while, but one day on a plane, I wanted water and coffee, and I could do it once, just once, with you. <laughs> yeah. You're all, it's very bad for us. <laughs> I, know. I was like, forget alcohol and heroin. Diet Coke is killing us. It's like, to the mountains. When I look out at you, how absurd to think of Diet Coke killing me. I'm flying through the air, and there you are, white and dangerous. Who's kidding who? My box. See how juvenile you are if you laughed at that title. I was like, I didn't know if I only went to that junior high, but. In terms of design, one box is colored orange. Actually, I think there's a heart crane line sort of filtered through my father in here. In terms of design, one box is colored orange. The one you want, it always is, and sits in the bathroom of anyone's house because that's what she wants. It's choosing that wakes things up. I wondered how long all that I needed and encountered here would come like a wave. Not the shake, but the after effects. And this box did say there was a way to see this thing alone, one thing. July called it calculus. What is comes in boxes. What is not comes in waves, the dots between. Mountains surround us, and I say they are more marvelous than the sea. Way overhead. I like flying over them, too, thinking, that is home. These these crazy bumps. When we drive into them tomorrow, it won't be bam. It means swirling, it means up, swirling on the edge of a cup. And if you don't watch me like a hawk, I won't be scared. I want to be loved like a sunbeam. That is, it comes across the room or the ocean. You know the way I drive? I want to lift your fear like a bonnet and kiss your living face. Here, this is mine. Don't misunderstand me. Your house. I've walked past your childhood several, several times, and friends of mine babysat your friends. The enormous calm this morning, kernels flowing through my clenched fist into an old-fashioned milk bottle, exactly I've constructed that time. I thought waves, wooden ones, no flames. As a good middle, I climb on top and then politely move over. I was sexually abused by an entire house. Every shake of the building was my lover. Me abandoning you from not noticing me, eating alone for years in my family, not putting my foot down but not picking it up either. Suddenly strong in the new presumed position, wider than, no more private than yes. Everyone's with men all of a sudden. Men made like my time. In the morning, didn't choke the limits of the bottle, can leave me in satiety. Not safety, something more native. Listen to me, going all horny. Play, lover, play. Popsicle. After the bearded men and the coffee cleaned up pure streams navigate your hands, our sun is a puzzle the buildings have met. Your long legs navigate the kitchen. Sweet clatter, cluck, our eggs are done. Now everything's heading to the forest to feed on me. That was kind of John Wiener's. Oh. Glowing stick. I'm probably now and always was a real complete idiot. One lies on its back by the bed, glowing stick, a wand to shave my head, to call, to paste my hybridity onto. What is it thus? A meaning of a meeting of a meeting? I say a kiss. The stripes are enormous, day and night, and we like the enormity of fuck and love, the impossible words that leave us on our platforms in the sun, spinning. I want to be on a beach with you, too, a beach on Mars. There was a woman I claimed I would be dead with if I couldn't have her alive, and you are greater than either in our synapse. I love you in the blind spot of our changing ages. Thanks. <laughs>